You're listening to Bullpen Science with Dr. Richard Applin, the podcast that gives you real health solutions to your real health problems. And now, your visionary host, Dr. Richard Applin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bullpen Science. Hi, I'm Dr. Applin, your host, and I have with me Teresa and Glenda. Say hello, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Well, on today's podcast, we're going to talk about, one, the article of the week that we have. But before we do that, I wanted to mention that we did finish the series on stress. Uh, The title was How to Get in Front of Stress. And we did a four-part series over the month of April. And we have those audio files being edited, and they will be put on the podcast. You know, we had a lot of fun in that class. Uh, We learned a lot. And one of the things that I noticed from the questions that were being asked from the participants was that people are looking for a different answer. Uh, I believe people are finally getting to the point where they're seeing that the science that we're using today is really not offering any explanation as to why things are happening to them. You know, I mentioned in one of the classes that 70% or over 70% of the adult population in this country is taking at least one prescription drug, and over 50% of the population are taking at least two or more drugs. Well, what that really means to me is that we have a sick country. And, you know, if more people are sick than healthy, then it would seem that we would need to redefine what normal is. And so now the normal or the norm for the adult population is for people to be sick. Well, I just don't buy into that. All right, I think that's a flaw in the system. And we need to evaluate a different science or at least look at a different science that will better explain what's going on. And the science actually exists. It's actually neuroscience. And neuroscience looks at the processes You see, modern-day science is a cause-and-effect science. So if you have an effect, they look for a cause. But if the effect is the end product of a process, they're not going to find a cause. And how many times have people gone to the doctor and they have a, a very particular complaint, the doctor evaluates the patient and says he can't find anything, so it must just be in your head. We can go ahead and put you on some drugs, but we really don't have any idea what's going on. So another statement is, you know, you're just going to have to learn how to live with it. How many times have we heard that? That it's part of the aging process. Yeah, I always laugh about this part of the aging process. We have patients that come in and they claim that their condition is part of the aging process. And so I ask, well, how's the aging process affecting the other areas of your body that are working fine? Apparently that section that was being affected was born early. (laughs) <laughs> and that's just not the way it is. I mean, but the thing is, is we people are, ex, you know, we've accepted those statements. And the reason why is because we did not understand that there was actually a science out there that could explain these processes in a way that made sense. And as a result, there's certain things that we can do, not only in a doctor's office, but there are things that we can do with the patient outside the office to actually help change these processes. And I think one of the biggest things is to learn how to let go. How many people have problems letting go? I do. Mostly everybody does. I think we do. And you know what? I think the reason why is because we were never taught that we were supposed to let go. We just were taught that we were supposed to stay on. And if you think about how society is now with Wi-Fi and the Internet and, you know, we used to have beepers. Now we don't. We just have smartphones. There is no downtime. People come home from work and they go straight to their computer and they're still going until they go to sleep at night. And so you really have no downtime. And downtime is vitally important for the body not only to consciously relax, but to unconsciously repair itself uh, during the sleep process. And that brings up a whole nother ball game, this whole issue of sleep. You know, a lot of people sleep, but they don't rest. And so you hear patients all the time and say, well, I slept all night, but I woke up dog tired. Well, for good reason. You never rested. And so we actually have to teach people how to rest. And you can learn that. You can learn that skill. So that's one of the things that we were wanting to talk about this morning. The next thing actually is this article of the week. 
And the article of the week is talking about this growing evidence that suggests that antimicrobial soaps are actually damaging to the body. And we've had this topic come up through the years. Uh, I am not a proponent of using antimicrobial soaps. Uh, the soap that we have in the office is just pure soap. And I strongly recommend to patients that they do not use this and that they use regular soap. Now, so what's so bad about antibacterial things? I mean, the, I mean, what you want is to kill the bad bacteria. So what's wrong with it? Well, that, you know, it sounds logical based on the science of cause and effect. Well, you have this bad bacteria <laughs> on your hands and you're about to eat food. So you don't want the bacteria to get into the food and get into your body. Well, yeah. So let's just kill the bacteria. Well, the problem is, is that you're killing all the bacteria and that the human body is covered, believe it or not, with bacteria. All right, then we have these little bugs all over us and we live in a harmonic balance with these bugs. And by killing the bad ones and the good ones, you actually are creating more problems. So using antibacterial soaps or hand sanitizers or, you know, things like that, that's upsetting the harmony? Not only just the harmony, but what happens is that you're not killing 100% of the bugs. And so some of the bugs that actually make it through the onslaught of this bacterial soap are actually mutating, forming superbugs. And so now you can have not only good and bad bacteria on your body, you can actually have these superbugs. And some of the new research that's coming out is showing that especially with Staph aureus, which is one of the most common skin infection agents, is actually not killed by this antibacterial soap, but it's actually made to stick to your skin even harder. And see, the whole idea behind soap is not really to sanitize. It's actually to sloth off or get the bugs to come off your hands. All right, it's not necessarily designed to kill the bug, it just wants to get the bugs off your hands. And that's really the best thing to do. Okay, so using this stuff, using this these products can, number one, um, disrupt the harmony. Number two, create super bugs. Is there anything else we need to look out for? Well, I mean, if you don't really want to be eating these dead bugs, <laughs> then I would say go wash your hands with soap. But wait a minute, wait a minute now. <laughs> I'm not talking about hand sanitizer. <laughs> I'm still washing off, kind of, because I'm still using soap, but it has this thing in it that does something else. Right. So it, it still is washing off my hands, but what happens, like, when it goes down the drain? Do I need to, you know, think further in my future, in my children's future? Well, absolutely. I mean, you look at some of, well, look at the two most common products used in these antibacterial soaps or antimicrobial soaps. It's called tricosalin or mm -hmm. triclosin and uh, triclocarbon, I believe, is the, the other one. And what they're finding is that these products do not break down when they go into the sewer system. And so for areas that use reclamation processes on water and sewage, they're finding out that these products are actually in the water after they have reclaimed it and processed this water. And some areas, like uh, the agricultural areas, are actually using reclaimed water to spray on their crops. And so what they're finding is that these products are actually now in the crops. So for those of us who do not want to use this, if we don't stop, we're going to create a culture of people that are actually getting this product through the food source. So there's another thing about uh, organic farming that uh, would be of benefit to everyone. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. It, you know, when you talk about some of these things, Dr. Ethel, just frankly, it seems overwhelming. What can we do? You feel so small and so minute. What is it that I can do to make such a huge difference that my children won't eat crops that have been watered by this stuff? Well, I think that one of the biggest things is to talk with your family members about processes, all right, how the human body actually works. And you don't have to be a scientist to understand that the human body processes not only the food that we take in, but all sorts of information that we take in from the environment. And we're supposed to be in this balance. You know, in the morning times, we're supposed to be on. 
And in the evening times, we're supposed to slow down so that we can rest at night so that we can be on the next day. But if you're constantly on, you can't, you can't possibly think that this body is going to last or maintain itself in some type of healthy expression. Right. You're going to have problems. Right. Now, you need some kind of fuel source. And so does it make sense to try to use some type of scientifically engineered fuel source or to use some fuel source that God created? Well, you know, some would argue, of course, that you're going to say what God created, but some, what about, I'm sorry. <laughs> what about the people that say, well, this is not natural. This process that I'm dealing with isn't natural. It's not natural for me to go, I don't know, 18 hours a day going strong, catch a few hours of sleep and then do it over again. So because it's not natural, I need something unnatural to handle this because the natural stuff is just not going to work. It's not strong enough. Right. And so what we're trying to do is manipulate our environment to support our desire. <laughs> well, I mean, that's all nice and fine for the short term, but you know, that's the, one of the biggest things in this culture is we always have this concept of short-term gain, but we forget about the other half of that statement, which is long-term loss. So yeah, it may work fine for the short term, but you are definitely going to pay the consequence. Now, the science that we're using doesn't even consider those processes. It just says, wait until you have a problem and then we'll put out the fire. Well, if you keep doing that, how many fires could you possibly make and can you get to a point where you can't put out the fire fast enough? Right. And I think that's where a lot of people are today. Yeah. Running fast nowhere. Absolutely. Running <laughs> fast nowhere. <laughs> so that's one of the things, or the couple of things that we wanted to talk about uh, today. Now, we are going to be starting a new series with our podcast. And I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Uh, the new series is going to be titled, What to Do When Your Science Falls Short. Uh, this, uh, this title actually came to me as a result of teaching the class how to get in front of stress. And I think it's a very telling title. Uh, and there's a lot of different components to what to do when your science falls short. And so we look forward to the next podcast. I hope you guys have a really great day. And this is Dr. Applin with Bullpen Science. You've been listening to Bullpen Science with Dr. Richard Applin. To learn more about real health solutions to your real health problems, call us at 256-203-9433 or visit us online at envisionchiropractic.com today.